housekeeping review, the emergency bathrooms, or the entrance is right over there where Kent is standing. And on the tables, we have fans and other stuff that you might need. In the red cooler, we have ice water. If you need some ice water, please don't get overheated. But really, the weather's pretty nice compared to what it has been. No hurricanes uh, or anything like that. Uh, I would like to just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this day is yours, and we thank you for it. I pray that you be with folks that we're especially concerned about, uh, with Cynthia and her family as her mother's passed away, Lord, for Gary and the pain that he's dealing with, uh, for many others with different concerns maybe we don't even know about. I uh, pray for the young people here as, as their lives are on hold in many ways, and I pray that you would give them wisdom. And Lord, I just confess to you that I, I am tired uh, and weary of the virus and all the social upheaval. I think we all are. And we just need your endurance. And we need your patience. We need your wisdom. I pray that you would just encourage us and Speak to us through your word this morning as we look at life's detours, how we just kind of get blown off track and our lives are put on hold by big things and little things. I pray that you would just speak to us from the gift of the book of Esther. And Lord, we just pray that you prepare our hearts for worship. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Tyler, lead us in some worship.
Thanks, Skylar. Yeah, I can play like that. <laughs> Don't choose to. Great to see everybody here. We've got folks in the cars, the pavilion and tent on the Isle of Patmos over there <laughs> under the trees. And then we have hundreds of folks watching on Facebook, and especially our young parents. I want you to please yeah. pray for them. Think of it now. They've got to make decisions on what they're going to do with bringing their kids to school or not. Or uh, imagine trying to bring kids to church during all this and all that goes with that. So I don't want to leave them out in my bag here. I have just about every key that I own. Even the old antique ones for uh, my house. Everything I have basically has a key. All the possessions I have. The, I have, to have a key to get in the church building here, a key to get in my home and uh, the shop and my cars. And I have foot lockers and chests and things like that that uh, have keys that you have to get into. Now, if I were to lose these keys, I'd be in a pickle. So those of you who are mischievous, don't even think about trying to sneak up here and take this. That just wouldn't be nice, okay? So, it basically, if I don't have the key, let's say, to my truck, I'm going to have to go get a locksmith to come out there and get in the truck for me. I am kept out of the truck. Now, I bring this up as our object lesson to start off this morning for the kids and for the grown-ups. Because uh, we think that in our lives, the key to God's helping us and being with us and blessing us is when things are going well and according to our plans. And when they're not, we think, well, the key's gone and God must not be there or I must have done something wrong. And I want to tell you that there is nothing in your life, no situation no detour, no plan B, no tragedy, no perplexity, nothing in your life that can happen can keep God from working to bless you. Nothing. So remember that. God doesn't need a, a key of everything doing okay and everything working out right. He can work anywhere and in anything. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, bless us as we lose our keys, sometimes literally, sometimes the keys to our life uh, and peace of mind are, are when bad things happen or things we don't understand or things we can't control. Lord, I pray that you would remind us that you are still in control and that you haven't been stopped one inch. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, I want you to turn to the book of Esther, the book of Esther. We're in chapter two of Esther, and I introduced you last week in Esther chapter one to a fine man named Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus, he was a king of a vast empire that stretched out from India thousands of miles into reaching into Africa and uh, Western Asia. And several years have gone by between what the events of chapter 1, where we uh, were living last week, and chapter 2. Chapter 1, you basically heard and learned that uh, this king, who is also known as Xerxes, uh, was a party animal. He loved having a good time, he loved spending money, and he had lots of it because he took it from people all over the world within his reach. He just, might makes right, and he took what he wanted, okay? And remember his bloated ego? Remember how high and mighty he was? I mean, he was used to getting what he wanted. In fact, he would have holidays for six months. Uh, basically, the whole purpose was, come look at me, I am awesome, and I have power, and I have money, and he just showed off his stuff, and he showed off who he was. And remember his drunken feast for a week, and all his yes-men were gathered around him, and he tried to treat 
his queen like a personal possession and an object, uh, tried to uh, ask her to do something that was immodest at the very least, to come before all his drunken friends and show off her beauty. And scholars argue about how far that request really was. But anyway, she did uh, the moral thing, or maybe she had some dignity of her own, some pride, and she would not do it. And the king was not used to being told no, and he completely unwinds. He completely melts down. And yes, uh, he thought by passing a law that uh, wives need to listen to their husbands, that that was going to put that whole matter to rest. Yeah, okay, let me know how it works out for you, Xerxes. Uh, obviously not, okay? Uh, but needless to say, this really was not a question of wives listening to husbands. This was a question of just totally out of control egomaniac, treating other people as personal objects of his pleasure, and he doesn't care about them. Well, I, I introduced last week that Xerxes decided to go on a little trip, and uh, there was one area of the world that was up and coming that he was very concerned about. Greece, Athens, Sparta, all the great Greek city-states were coming into ascendancy and into power. And uh, this is the dawn of Western civilization happening in Greece. And he, he looks over there on his maps and says, Oh, wait a minute, that's an area of the world that I am not dominating. We've got to take care of that. So historians believe that he took over a million-man army and a naval fleet. And he mustered all the resources of the kingdom and marched against Greece on the other side of the world. And things didn't work out well for him there. Remember the fleet and the pontoon bridge he had built to invade Greece uh, were destroyed in a storm. And he was so upset, he executed the engineers and he sent his soldiers out to give 300 lashes to the sea. Because the sea had dared to defy his will. That's, when, that's who we're dealing with here. Anyway, he lost. He failed. Greece went on to, to rule the world later. But in any case, he goes back to Persia, to his uh, winter palace at Susa. And he's had a little bit of an attitude adjustment. He's learned that the world isn't his oyster. Okay. He's learned that he can't always get what he wants. He used a Rolling Stone song there, there. He begins to think back over his life, and he's had enough time to think about his ways. And it says in chapter 2, verse 1, After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti. Who's Vashti? His queen that he treated terribly. He, he threw her out of her position. Tradition says he executed her, but we don't really know what happened to her. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. And that's all it says. He remembered. So let me fill in the details of what I think that means. Because the, his personal attendants, his yes-men, their immediate solution is, is basically to recommend you need another queen. You need to look for all the beautiful young women in your empire and pick one out. And we can, we can help you out with that. Why would they say that? He was missing Vashti. I think he had some regrets. I think he woke up and said, what was I thinking? I was drunk, but I can't take it back now. And he was, he wanted some comfort. He was looking more towards home rather than his own uh, ambitions. And so here's the plan that they come up with. Still not very nice. Still treating women as just objects to be used. He basically... Uh, the government sends out word all across the empire to all the provinces to bring in all the best looking girls from all over and they're going to be prepared in a harem. It's like uh, they're on deck. 
okay, in a baseball game, okay? Before you can get checked out by the team, you've got to get on deck. They're on deck and they're prepared for months and months and months with beauty treatments and classes on how to please the king. And uh, basically, uh, whenever the king feels like it, he tries one out and uh, then sends her to the second harem, which basically they live in isolation for the rest of their lives unless the king calls on them for some reason and they could never get married. They could never have children. They could never have a life. They don't get to see their families. They're just living in a gilded cage for the rest of their lives. And these are hundreds and hundreds, Josephus, the historian says there were 400, of these women, one right after another, as Xerxes tries to make up his mind. Now this for one girl and for all of these girls is what you call a life detour. Talks about Esther, starting in verse 5, by introducing a man named Mordecai. Now Mordecai uh, was a descendant of Jews who had been detoured from their home country and drug off to Persia. We don't know of Mordecai having a wife or a family or children of his own. Many people believe he was a eunuch in the king's service, so he couldn't have children. He couldn't have a family. But his niece was named Esther, or also uh, her other name, Hadessa, her Jewish name, which means Myrtle. Esther means star. She, her parents had died. She was an orphan. And so her uncle Mordecai raised her as his own daughter. Now Esther, I'm sure, had dreams. Just like you girls do. I mean, the, maybe you have something you want to do, a school you want to go to, or something you want to do with your life. Maybe you look forward to, to having a, a husband or a family, maybe you have a profession or something you want to do with your life. I'm sure Esther had dreams like every girl does. And all of a sudden she woke up one morning and there is a king's messenger standing at the door saying, you'll do, time to come to the palace uh, for the harem. She didn't have much of a choice in the matter. If you look at the scripture in verse 8, so in the king's order, chapter 2, verse 8 of Esther, so in the king's order, and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in the custody of Hedai, Esther also volunteered. Is that what it said? Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Hedai who had charge of the women. That word taken in Hebrew can literally mean forcibly taken. It's a little more ambiguous than that, but needless to say, she woke up one morning with dreams and plans and hopes, and by the end of the day, her entire life was off the rails. The rest of her life, regardless of how this turned out, was now going in a completely different direction. At the very best, she would not be able to pick who she wanted to marry. At the very best, she would not be able to pursue uh, it, any dreams that she had. All that was going to be decided for her. Now, if you've ever been going down the road and uh, you had a place you wanted to go, and maybe you were following GPS, or maybe you were following the mental map in your mind. Maybe you've traveled this road many times before, and you see that big orange sign there, and the man standing, or the woman standing in the middle of the road with a stop sign, waving you off to a detour going God knows where, through the back roads. Some of, some of you are like, oh yeah, that's great, I know where those roads go. Well, you know, sometimes you don't. And you don't know how long it's going to be. It, kind of like in March 13th. Uh, basically, you know, when I woke up and the whole world had taken a detour. 
and church was not going to be the same. And here I am, months later, still on the detour. Amen? So, what do we do when we are detoured in life? When our plans completely go off track, just like what happened in Esther. Well, the first thing of two that I really want to emphasize today that I see here in God's Word is let detours bear beautiful character. Let detours bear beautiful character. I've told you before about uh, an accident that Tammy and I were in when uh, we were engaged. And it was uh, one winter night in Kentucky. And we were on our way to Louisville on the highway. And we were crossing a long bridge, and the bridge was just covered with ice. I was driving in a Zuzu Trooper, yes, it was Pam, and uh, started going, as the Southerners would say, Willy Wampus in every direction. And uh, before I knew it, I was ro flipping end over end and rolling down an embankment. And as I was uh, flipping and hitting my head on the roof every time it rolled, I thought, ouch, ouch, ouch. And at the bottom, rescue squads and personnel were already there because there were already eight other cars down there. And they continued to come off uh, the bridge. In any case, to make a long story short, as uh, I was recovering in the hospital and they, they figured my brain wasn't any more damaged than it had already been, we met another couple there young couple from Louisville who had a small toddler. They had been in an accident. Their cars had been totaled too. And we got together and made arrangements uh, for a hotel, right? And then we helped each other out. We were strangers before that time, had never met. Helped each other out, move all of our stuff. Our car had been packed with all of our worldly possessions. And they helped us pick them up from the snow out there in the embankment as they've been thrown everywhere. Uh, we helped them as well pick up their stuff and over the next couple of days we helped move all this stuff back to Louisville and we visited with one another. We parted ways. It was like God's angels just kind of helping us out. And that experience, that detour in our plans brought out beautiful character in our lives. It could have brought out selfishness and defensiveness and anger or bitterness. God, why did you let this happen to me? Our fear, what are we going to do now that we've lost all of our stuff? Anger at the locals who actually came out and picked like vultures through our stuff on the embankment while we were in the hospital. But you know, all of that subsided in the beautiful character of Christ just came out between us. Generosity and love and concern. And there was a peace that everything was going to be okay. That's exactly what happens in Esther. Here Esther, I believe, it starts out, I, see, I think you see the foundation of her character when she loses her parents. And that makes a lot of folks bitter. Maybe they feel sorry for themselves or they think I didn't have the advantages that other people did. But Esther, something different happens. That early tragedy or loss in her life combined with the unconditional love of a relative who cared about her brought out beautiful character. If you look in chapter 2, in verse 9, when Esther is brought into the custody of the palace, it says in verse 9, talking about Haggai, the guy who was in control there, the eunuch, and the young woman pleased him and won his favor. Now here's a eunuch. He has no sexual motives with these women. That's the whole point of him being a eunuch. He's there to, can you even imagine, your job being running the show for 400 women. That's, uh, even if you're a woman, that's not a very promising prospect. 
Imagine the drama. Imagine the tears every night as all these girls who have been ripped from their homes uh, are, are upset and traumatized. And it's his job to fulfill his king's edict to try to get these women together. Maybe the six months of beauty treatments wasn't so much about the beauty treatments as getting these girls emotionally uh, healed and further along enough to actually come before the king without breaking down in tears because of all that had been taken from them. But he immediately recognizes, now he knows women, he knows girls, and Esther, the name means star, she, her character shines out at him like a star on a black, dark night. He immediately recognizes a teachable spirit in her. He immediately recognizes a humility. He immediately recognizes an unselfish, beautiful character that has come out in this tragedy. And immediately he is drawn to her. And this continues. As her treatments go on and as she goes on, it says uh, down in verse 15, Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. She wasn't shallow like the others. She wasn't conniving and manipulative like the others. She didn't demand her own way. She didn't scheme and try to figure out a way to get ahead. There was something beautiful about her character. And when she does eventually go before the king, it's no surprise in verse 17, it says, The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. And when she went before the king, she could take anything she wanted, any outfit, any bit of jewelry, and rather than going her own way and leaning on her own understanding, she trusted, she trusted her supervisor who had helped her and showed her favor. And he recommended to her how to go before the king. She, he knew what he was talking about. Let detours bear beautiful character. Now this is one thing I am thankful for at Cobham Park. Baptist Church. Because it's nuts out there, folks. Nuts, nuts, nuts. Crazy. Amen? Can I get an amen about that? People are divided and ripping into one another. The country's in flames in some areas. No matter what your political persuasion is, it's enough to make you mad or afraid all at the same time. And this is a detour that we've all been forced on. We've been taken out of our plans, out of our preferences, out of our dreams, and been sent off on a detour God knows where. And I am so thankful for you that rather than turning on one another, rather than being terrified, rather than being bitter and enraged, although we all have our moments, I have seen the beautiful character of Jesus Christ being brought forth in you. It's like we, it's like the, those friends of ours in the accident. In that, in that tragedy, something beautiful has happened. And I see that happening with you. Maybe it brought out what was already there. Maybe it also created something new and improved as we as we look to Jesus and who he really is without distractions. But thank you. And I want to challenge you. There, may, there are other things that you're facing, I know, that are even more intimidating in some ways because they're very personal to your family, to your life, than the COVID-19 virus. Maybe you have relationship issues or financial issues or health issues or personal things that you're trying to heal in. Lean into Jesus, who is a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. Lean into him and you will find his beautiful character 
being born in your heart and your life. And that itself is its own reward. But there's something even better. And that is this. Know that God works in detours too. Know that God works in detours too. Just like I told the kids in the children's message part there at the beginning of the sermon. Don't believe the hogwash of the devil that God's there only when you feel him. Or you see him. Or that things are going great in your life. No, as Romans 8.28 makes clear, in all things he's working for your good. He is in the detours too. And you, you have to look no further than the book of Esther in chapter 2 to see that. Here she is, ripped from her family, ripped from her dreams, traumatized and treated as a sexual object, assaulted, and there's nothing she can do about it. And yet, she leans into God, and God, although He's unseen and unmentioned in chapter 2, we can recognize that He is at work. Here are the Jews, the people of God, nobodies in Persia. No money, no power. Anti-Semitism is rampant. We're going to get to that later in Esther. No power or influence. No political clout. And look at this. As one of those Jewish girls is taken advantage of, although that's wrong and evil, that doesn't stop God from working powerfully. And here he is. He's going to take one of these girls that nobody cares about, and she's going to be queen of the empire above all the elites, above all the evil people are in control. She was born for such a time as this, as God's sovereign hand is working in the background. Let me tell you, that's exactly what he's doing in you and in me. Even when he doesn't cause evil, he can't tempt anyone, he is not evil, he is holy, that doesn't mean he does not work behind the scenes to thwart the devil at every turn. The devil must be a frustrated person, I tell you. Just when he thinks he has spit in God's face and spurned his authority, he turns around, there is God standing triumphant above him again. Working behind the scenes to do his will. I remember I had a professor in seminary who was a proud man. He was a member of the special forces in uh, Africa, in uh, one of the, the, the segregated nations. And uh, he didn't have much use for God. Might makes right. One day he was out in Johannesburg riding his motorcycle at full speed. And a large truck pulled right out in front of him. And his high-speed motorcycle collided with the back of that truck. And those, those steel rails that go right across the back hit him right in the face. It split his full visor helmet in half. And broke every bone in his face. Did terrible damage. He was in the hospital for... A year or six months or something like that. That's what you call a detour. A life detour. Let me tell you, as he lay in that hospital bed, this one nurse began to take special interest in him. And he knew it wasn't because of his good looks, because his face was completely destroyed. She was a Christian. They fell in love. Ended up getting married. He came to Christ. He felt a call in ministry. He ended up going to seminary. He ended up teaching me at seminary. And as he looked back on that tragic detour of his life where all his plans were thrown aside, he recognized that God didn't necessarily do that to him, but God was working in the detour for his good. He's doing that for you. 
He's doing that for me. If you want to have further proof of that, I want you to look at the, the greatest detour that has ever occurred. That happened to the Son of the living God. God came and walked among us as a man. His name was, say it, Jesus. He taught us. He loved us. He healed us. Until that day when he met what everyone saw as a detour. And they took him and they spat upon him and they slapped him and they exposed him to a sham trial and they scourged him until he bled and they nailed him to a cross and they watched him die an agonizing death. What a detour. How could even... Jesus himself called out, you remember, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet on Easter morning, the world, Jesus, and us found out that God is more at work in the detours than he is everywhere else. Through that, he not only raised the Son of God to life again, showing the world who he was and is, but he saved my very soul. He saved you. That same Jesus is with you in your detour right now. The detour that is 2020. Father God, I pray that we look at this girl, this humble girl named Esther. You work behind the scenes in her life. You brought out beautiful character. I pray that you do that in me. Lord, my silliness, my feeling sorry for myself, my bitterness, my worry, my anger. Lord, may that be eclipsed by the character of Christ as I just yield myself to you in this detour that we're living through. Lord, we put our trust in you. We look to you. And right now, if there's someone here who does not know you, I pray that in this detour, in this worship service, this humble service, that you that they would pray this prayer with me. Lord, I don't know what's happening to me or in the world, but I trust in you. Do what you want to and what you will in my life. I am yours. Do something beautiful in the ugly mess that I've walked in. I want to be a Christian in my heart. All God's people say, Amen. Watch and listen as how the Lord answers your prayer. I will lead us.
Father God. We are yours, and miracle by miracle, you are ours in Jesus. That is enough blessing for us. Help us to live in that joy. Christ we pray, amen.